to ping pong propulsion, precision ping pong propulsion. Uh, it's uh, to me the most fun event, but that's a, just a personal observation. Um, just out of curiosity, can we get people to hit the chat button who are new to the event? Uh, just so that uh, in the end we can get a rough idea of, uh, as to percentage of new people uh, for this year. <clears throat> See how many responses we get. And <clears throat> two. Like, let's see what we got here. Uh, we have one, two, one, two, three, five, six. Well, it looks like a fair number here. Uh, right. We have a question from uh, Bob Vandet. Okay. And the question is. Sorry, I was just raising my hand that I was new. That's all. Oh, okay. oh understood. Apologies. <laughs> no, that's all. No, no big deal. Thanks for calling on me. <laughs> it's, yep. uh, this this is cool. I watched it last year when the kids were doing it. It's pretty cool. Okay. So it looks like we have a, a good number of newbies this year. So uh, what I'll do is I'll briefly read, uh, uh, go through the rules. I'm assuming that uh, all of you are aware that you can get a, a, a current copy of this year's rules on the, on the uh, Macomb County Science Olympiad website under elementary. Uh, if you click on the uh, precision ping pong propulsion uh, uh, event, you can usually down, download those rules from there. And if you have any questions uh, uh, that aren't answered today, uh, I would recommend frequently going to the website right up until two or three days before the main event in May, uh, because any questions that any team uh, presents uh, between now and then, we will respond to within a day or two and post that online so that uh, uh, everybody has access to those answers. Um, so with that, uh, I'll begin. Um, the, this event is designed for one or two participants per team, um, and it involves uh, basically uh, the students to design, construct, test, and demonstrate uh, at the tournament a device that can shoot uh, pretty accurately and consistently um, uh, a ping pong ball uh, to a target at a, at a prescribed distance that will be determined the day of either the district event or the main event. And the, the students won't know that distance uh, until the, uh, the day of that uh, uh, event, just to kind of keep things uh, uh, fair and, you know, no, not having advanced knowledge of the, of the distance, because we want them to practice at the multiple distances that uh, that could be assigned, anywhere from four to eight meters in half meter increments. Uh, uh, we have a question from uh, August Kowal. Kowal, okay, go ahead. Hello. Uh, you can unmute your microphone and ask your question there. But yeah, you answered my question. I was I was wondering what the range of uh, what what our range was that we we're supposed to be testing these things at. Okay, the, the smallest the smallest distance is four meters. The largest is eight, um, and we do and it could be any one of those distances uh, at, in half meter increments. So four meters, four and a half, five, five and a half, etc. Uh, and that and that number will be assigned the day of the event. Uh, is is that what you're looking? That's the information you're looking for. Yeah, thank you. Okay, uh, that 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 information is also in the rules. So uh, one other uh, important point is that 
uh, during the event, safety goggles or glasses have to be worn um, by all the team team members. Uh, the reason for that is not so much, you know, getting hit by a ping pong ball, which is a low mass uh, uh, p uh, piece, but uh, I've seen uh, some of the launching devices uh, fall apart under the tension of whatever they use for the energy and go flying across the gym. So we do that basically for safety. And the other issue is putting some sort of a soft material under the device, either pads or a blanket or some, some, something rubber, whatever felt, uh, to prevent scratches on the uh, gymnasium floors because we did have uh, one year where we had kind of caused some uh, significant damage to the floor that they had to make an insurance claim on. So that's, that's also in the rules. Uh, regardless, there are no real um, um, material or size restrictions for the launcher, um, but uh, you don't want to create something hazardous. So we don't allow things like uh, gasoline or lead acid batteries. If you're using electricity, you're going to use uh, typically normal batteries like uh, Duracells or rechargeables or whatever. Uh, there will not be electricity that you can plug into available, so it has to all be self-contained. Um, uh, we have a question from Andy. Okay, Andy, go ahead. Good morning, everybody. Um, I have a question. Uh, does it, it so it can't be a handheld uh, device? This yes, it can. There's stuff? nothing in the rules that say it says it can't be handheld. Okay. Okay. I mean, mo most of the ones we see are, they, they kind of sit on the floor, uh, but I've seen uh, over the past years, handheld devices. So yes, they are acceptable. Okay, thank you very much. All right. Um, <clears throat> all right, so uh, let's see. You, uh, you, can, you can load all of the, the balls uh, of which there are 15, uh, onto the device uh, either singularly or all at once, but you can only shoot, you basically you shoot one at a time. Um, is there another, I see another question there. Uh, yes, from Christine. Okay, Christine. I just wanted to circle back about the goggles. If someone okay. has prescribed glasses, do they need to wear the goggles over the prescribed glasses? Uh, yes. Yeah, it has. you have to have either goggles or safety glasses. Um, it, it seems irritating. I wear glasses too, but uh, during the event, I have safety goggles on top of mine. Um, and I had to get used to doing that when I was uh, working in the field as an architect. Uh, it, it's not always pretty or fun, but uh, safety is is uh, important to us. So does that answer your question? Yes, thank you so much. All right. Um, uh, there's so another question from uh, John Hanna in the chat. OK, um, if you have a third team member, are they allowed to participate at the competition or are only two allowed? Uh, at the main competition, only two, but I believe at the districts, uh, they are allowed to have three because they tend to be practice sessions. And that way, if one of your team members drops out, you still have your, your third who becomes the second in that event. In, or in that, in that, you know, if that occurs. But typically, it's, it's the team size is limited to one or two participants. And I can, if you like, I can go back and verify that with John, but I'm pretty certain that's the current, uh, the current uh, rule. <clears throat> Is that a sufficient response? Yeah, that's sufficient, yes. thank you. Okay, okay. Um, <clears throat> so, Basically, your your goal is to hit a target, which is uh, in in our instance is a small, uh, roughly four foot diameter swimming pool with a bucket in in it. So there are two targets: the pool itself and the bucket that's within the pool, um, at the whatever the prescribed distance is. And when uh, the teams are released to shoot, um, they fire uh, their fifteen ping pong balls. Um, at their at their 
leisure. They have basically four minutes to complete the task, which is generally more than enough time. Um, uh, and we, we don't have... tell them what order to do the shooting, but I see we have another question. It's from August Kowal. Okay. Uh, I just want to uh, make a comment about the, you stated about the uh, safety goggles or safety glasses, but uh, we yes. were told that uh, they must be safety glasses or safety goggles. They, we, uh, safety glasses would not be permitted. Who told you that? Uh, our uh, the, the coordinator. Oh, because in the rules, uh, I have it printed, safety goggles or safety glasses must okay. be worn. Either is acceptable. Right, we thanks. will uh, check on that with the uh, event coordinator and make right. sure that that is correct. And if right. uh, there is a correction, it will be posted on the website. All right. So I'll highlight that as a question. All right. So uh, back to where I was. Um, basically, when I say go, they have four minutes to shoot. They start shooting their device at the targets. Anything that hits the either the pool or the bucket in the pool uh, is scored. Uh, per the values that are indicated in the in the rules. Um, anything that hits the floor, uh, either by going into the pool or the bucket, and it, even if it, if it bounces out and hits the floor, anything on the floor is considered dead and is not counted to, towards their score. Um, and uh, all, the, all the balls are marked. Everything actually is marked, the, the, the launcher, uh, the balls themselves, uh, any tools that you have that you need to make adjustments to the device as they're shooting, um, and also the data charts that are required, which basically is the team's uh, effort to, to figure out what uh, adjustments on their device allows them to hit whatever the half any of the half increment tar uh, target distances. So they have to kind of get a feel for uh, what they have to do to their device to hit those, those particular distances consistently. If you're hitting distances between the half meter increments, you ignore that data. And the, the data charts that we ask you to put together uh, is, there, uh, is the team's attempt to quantify the information in a way that they can use it while they're shooting. Uh, uh, we so have a question from Christine in the chat. Uh, uh, does okay. the bucket move or is it in the center of the pool? The bucket uh, is stationary in the center of the pool. OK, it's it's typically a uh, a Home Depot five gallon bucket uh, or, you know, the typical orange ones you see in Home Depot and it sits in the middle of the pool. The pool itself has sides on it that are about a, a little, I think, under or slightly over or under a foot high. Uh, and there's a little bit of a pad in the bottom of the pool that we put that kind of deaden the, uh, the tendency of some of the balls to bounce out. But random bounces and hits, mid-air collisions do occur, which might result in a ball either falling into one of the targets or bouncing, unfortunately, out onto the floor where it would be considered dead. Um, the, the balls themselves, uh, there are 15, 10 are white, which are the lowest uh, value balls. Four are orange or colored, uh, which are uh, weighted slightly more valuable. And then there's one orange or colored ball with a stripe, which is your, your highest value one. Um, obviously, if you get everything in the, in the bucket, they score higher than if you hit the pool because the bucket is a smaller target in the center of the, of the pool. Um, all the have, uh, all... Uh, sorry, we have another question okay. uh, in that, the that's chat. Fine. I, I uh, like does the it questions count? as they come, so uh, uh, does, go ahead. Does it count if the balls first bounce on the floor into the pool or bucket? It does not. You can you can uh, you can hit the pool or the bucket all air uh, or you can bounce off the floor multiple times. Uh, doesn't matter if it gets into the pool or the bucket. They count. Does that answer your question? Yep. 
Okay, cool. Um, all the, uh, and as I said before, the, the, the launcher itself, the, the balls all have to be marked and, and the way they have to be marked uh, either with the team name and or the team number is, is outlined uh, in the rules. Um, if anyone has questions, they can ask it. But here, let me, uh, I'm going to try and click over here so that I can scroll to page two. There's a, there's an image. Oops, not quite that far. There. There's a little bit of an image of what the pool in the, in the, and the bucket look like. Okay. Um, and uh, any, as I said, anything that hits those two, uh, those two elements, uh, they count. Okay. Uh, as far as, uh, uh, what page am I on here? All right. You can see that uh, at the top here, we're marking all the balls with the team number. And six. Uh, so that when we're scoring the teams, uh, it's easy for us to figure out whether it's a six or a nine. Uh, that has been a bit of an issue in, in, the, uh, in the past. Um, let me see if I can scroll down here a little bit. Okay. Um, all right, the target is there. I'm going to scroll down one more little bit here. Um, and around each, uh, we usually shoot uh, during the big event, we usually shoot eight teams at a time. So there'll be eight positions on the floor. And as you can see in this diagram, uh, there will be a launch line, which will be taped on the floor at the prescribed distance for that day. Uh, and that's, that's the line that uh, we, we set up all the, all the teams behind that line. And then uh, they, they cannot shoot until we say go. Uh, they cannot even set up until we say go. Once we say go, they load their devices and they start shooting, making the adjustments uh, as they need to, to hit the distance uh, to get it into the pool or the bucket. Um, when they we are shooting- have a question from Adnan. Okay. I had a question about the ping pong ball. So I got a bag full that has multiple different numbers on them. So I'm assuming we're just gonna use these for practice, which is fine. Where would I go to get basically new ping pong balls. Can I just buy regular ones just that so the color matches? I mean, I know how many orange yeah. ones I need and how many white ones. Right. You, you basically, um, when you're doing your practice sessions, typically, I don't believe we score them. Some events, some of, some of the districts, they do allow us to score. Other districts, they don't seem to, to, uh, to care about the scoring. I think Utica was one of them. Uh, where where it was more of a practice session, uh, the other districts tend to to run them like like it's the the, the real deal in May in May. Um, but you can typically buy you know you go to the store to buy the a standard ping pong ball. I think basically, they come in white, and you can also get colored balls. But once you know your team name uh, number, I would recommend that you uh, put that you, you you need to put that number for this year on on the ping pong balls and that, that was the other question that i had was uh basically the number will be assigned to the team eventually right yes yes it, it, i would imagine uh if they've registered they probably have a team name you might want to check with the uh, event coordinator gotcha. for, your, for your school yep okay all right thank you all right. Uh, let's see. Oh, when they're shooting, if the if when they're shooting, uh, any of the balls uh, fall across the line by accident, uh, those balls are considered dead. They cannot retrieve them and shoot them. However, if they fire the ball or they drop a ball on the ground and it stays behind the line, they're welcome to pick those up and shoot. That way, they'll get the maximum number of balls. Uh, into the target. Um, we have another question from Lisa. So, 
Okay, go ahead. Hi, um, I was just curious, do we have to register on the Science Olympiad page or are we already registered? Uh, I'm assuming that um, if you're here, somebody has already registered the team for this event, if they have an event coach. Okay. And uh, I have another question. Okay. When they're doing these, shooting these launchers, are they shooting them all into the same pool, like how this picture is showing? Yes. All teams shoot at the same time. So there are balls flying everywhere. I got you. Okay. Which, which, which adds to the fun. All right. Thank you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, before, before the event begins, uh, on the day of the main event, uh, Typically, all the teams check their devices, the balls, any tools they have, their data sheets. Each team checks all of that, all of that equipment into uh, the gym area <coughs> uh, or the impound area, as we call it. Um, and we examine the, uh, everything to make sure you have everything you need to shoot, everything from the goggles to the device, the balls, the data charts. And once you're logged in, or once you've checked in uh, and, and the device is impounded on the day of the shoot, uh, nobody else touches your device, uh, you're ready to go. Then when, you're, when you're, uh, the time for your event uh, comes around and the teams show up and we, we start setting them up, that's when they get their devices and we assign them a pos any one of the eight positions that you see on the screen. Um, you don't want to be late for impound because there's a penalty if you're late. I think uh, typically it's nine or nine thirty is the end of impound. You always want to be. You all always want to impound before the deadline, uh, uh, so that you don't get penalized points on your score. Um, just as a matter of, and and that is listed. I believe the the penalty uh, is listed in the rules. Uh, let me just scroll down here. Oh, that's for scoring. Uh, that's typically our issue. Uh, once the event is over, once you've done shooting, uh, we just ask the kids uh, take their devices back to the side where the impound was and pick up any of their balls that hit the floor only. The, the, uh, the supervisor, which is me, and any of my volunteers, we take care of any of the balls that hit the pool or the or the or the bucket, and we score the you know we we take what's in the pool first, score them on on our score sheets, and then we take all the balls out of the bucket, score them. At that time, once we once we're finished scoring all the teams for that particular shoot, then the kids can come back and retrieve uh, whatever remaining balls that. Uh, they were successful in hitting the target. Um, let's see. So the scoring is ours. We cannot tell you what your final score is because because of the weighted balls um, by color and also by which target they hit. Uh, all of that's done behind the scenes uh, in the marking room, in the scoring room, uh, by the computers. Um, so we won't be able to tell you exactly what your score is. Uh, let's see. Um, when you're shooting, uh, all of the uh, the teams, uh, the, the the team players, their their tools, and their data uh, and their data sheets uh, should all be behind the line as they're shooting, and they have to be cognizant uh, that in some cases the device will kind of lurch forward depending on how it's constructed. They have to be mindful to keep all parts of their device behind the line as they're shooting, uh, which is something that uh, some of our volunteers, we try to make sure that they're abiding by that rule. Uh, in the excitement of the shoot, a lot of times they, uh, they lose track of the, the kids lose track of that. Um, let's see. Oh, and uh, unlike past years, we used to have a ready line in addition to the launch line, but we eliminated that because it just seemed uh, superfluous and 
so now we just set them up right at the launch line. It just seems to simplify things and, and uh, make the event go a little bit quicker. Uh, <clears throat> let's see. What other. We have another question uh, from John in the chat. Are you okay. allowed to move the launcher as far back from the line as you want? Uh, you can move the launcher anywhere you want behind the line, although uh, I, I would assume that as long as you have uh, uh, you, you're shooting consistent, if you, if you have a prescribed distance that you want to set it behind the line, you're welcome to do that. There's nothing in the rules that says you can't. Uh, I would imagine, though, if you do that consistently as you collect your data to determine, uh, you know, uh, can you hit the prescribed distance with your, you know, with whatever settings you have, um, as long as you can record that consistently, then you'll know how to set up your machine. But the, the short answer is yes, you can set it as far back behind. You just can't cross the line uh, any closer uh, to the target. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it does, thanks. Okay. <clears throat> um let's see we have oh the 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 practice log uh, some people have taken the practice log and they they kind of treat it like a journal uh, the real intent is to basically log what information you need um, on the uh, on the settings that you need for, depending on how you design your device whether it's a uh, looks like a, a gun muzzle, you know, with a you're, you're loading balls into a tube. Uh, some of them, they look more like slingshots. But regardless of how they build their machine, you want to you want to determine things like distance to the target. Uh, if you have to raise or lower uh, a portion of your device to allow the ball to shoot at a certain angle to to drop into the target area, uh, what type of uh, uh, energy are you using, whether it's from a, uh, a rubber band. So you might want to determine what kind of rubber band you need to get to a certain distance. Uh, all of that information, uh, any and all of that information can be used on your practice log. And I will say this, the practice log is there for the use of the, the, the team, but it's also used by us to score your team in the event of a tie where we can't break the tie numerically simply by the number of ping pong ball but by the count of the number of ping pong balls and where they land if and we have in past had quite a few ties that we couldn't break numerically so we use the uh, the data sheet as a uh, a, a more subjective way to uh, to break those ties so the neater or the more uh, uh, obvious it is uh, when we look at it that we can tell, okay, you know what you're doing in terms of setting up your machine um, uh, and also uh, how well we, we know that the, the, the kids are understanding what they're doing to, 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 to get to that target. Uh, the better the data sheets, uh, probably the higher the probability that they would win in the event of a tie. Uh, also, if you don't hand in a data sheet, you get penalized. So you're always uh, you want to hand in some sort of a data sheet that shows us um, that the the kids kind of understand what it takes to to get to the targets. Does that make sense? Uh, I hope. Uh, we have a question from August in the chat. Okay. Please describe the rubber pads more specifically, and if they are provided during the event. No, uh, they are something that the team has to provide when they're constructing their device. They can be anything from a, a rug to felt pads to rubber pads to strips, anything, anything. Uh, what, what I found in the past is when they build devices, we've seen it where they've screwed uh, elements of the device onto a base and sometimes a screw head or a, or a, uh, a, a the head of a, of a nut, a nut or a bolt is facing down underneath the base. And as the device is moving around on the floor, those little things tend to scratch the floor. So what we do, we, we, we put the, we ask that the device, the base, 
of the device have some sort of a, uh, a soft uh, padding, whether it's felt, cloth, rubber, and it can be sheets, it can be little pads that you can, you know, like furniture pads, anything like that to, to, to keep the device from scratching the floor. Um, and you can get those at pretty much, pretty much anywhere, Home Depot, hardware store, whatever. Um, uh, what, am, what am I, what else can I say about that? Uh, that, well, that's pretty much it, but but it, it, it is basically, we will look for that too during check-in. And if you don't have the pads or something on there, we will hold your device back from uh, being f fully impounded and registered for, for the day. Um, I think we may have some videos online. Uh, I don't know if they show some of the pads, but if you, if you uh, if you, I can try and put together a list of uh, elements that you can use, but any any kind of uh, furniture pad or felt pad or or a rubber uh, kind of a sticky pad on there that would lift your device off the floor. They tend if they're if they're rubber, they tend also to hold the uh, to help hold the launching device in place on the floor, uh, which is typically a gymnasium floor, uh, so they don't move around as much. That might also help the kids uh, in their shooting. Um, I would also recommend that when you build a device that they're fairly, uh, they're not kind of uh, loosey-goosey and kind of wobbly uh, because accuracy in distance and also side to side uh, will also help the team uh, hit, hit their targets better and therefore score higher, uh, a higher score. Uh, Let's see. Doo -doo. Okay, you cannot. Uh, we talked about that. Um, let's see. Oh, um, the students can uh, hold their device down if they so choose. Uh, one thing they cannot do is, uh, unless they're farther back from the line that allows them to be in front of the device somehow. Uh, to hold it in place if that's what they need. Typically, we ask that they do it from the side so that they don't get, you know, if it misfires, but uh, they can hold their device down. Uh, the pads, by the way, for, for handheld launchers, uh, th that really is, is kind of not necessary if you have a handheld device uh, because you're obviously not sitting it on the floor. Uh, are there any other questions? I I do have they they I do have a section on scoring. Uh, let me get to that here, which you can read at your letter. Uh, that is the scoring. The, that's the last page of the instruction where it talks about scoring. Um, and I'm, I'm going to basically the, the largest number of points wins. And uh, for example, if you hit the stripe ball in the pool, that's probably the highest score that stripe ball will get. Uh, pardon me, in the bucket. Uh, that's the highest score it would get. In the pool, it would get the second highest score. Same thing with the colored balls. If you hit the pool or the, the bucket first, that's a higher score than if you hit the pool. And the white balls also uh, score higher in the in the bucket than they do in the pool. Um, if we have a tie, uh, we score the, the total points that are in the bucket first, then the total points scored by the colored balls only. And then uh, if we have still a tie, then we use those practice logs. So that kind of indicates the importance of your practice logs, one by turning them in and the quality of the log itself. Um, so, uh, and as you can see, each, each of the different, uh, colored balls has a multiplier assigned to it. So it's, so the value goes up based on which target it hits and what color the ball is. Um, we, oh, um, uh, as, uh, as I said before, the, the teams get four, four minutes to shoot. They usually get a one minute warning. Uh, it's very rare. Uh, I found that teams uh, go over the four minutes, 
but they usually like to hear the one minute warning so that if they've been taking a little bit too long, they can speed up their shooting to get all their, you know, uh, all their balls uh, launched. Uh, because obviously the more balls that hit the target, the higher your score is going to be. Um, any questions regarding scoring? Nothing. Uh, we have a question from Lisa. Okay, Lisa. Hi, um, I have a question about the log. It says they can get 50 points for the log. So is that yes. like a practice log? Like what does yeah, that, that consist is, of? That, that, yeah, um, basically what you do is you build your device and let's say you, 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 you're, you're asking your team members to say, okay, let's start shooting the way I would do it, I suppose, is to say, okay, let's start by hitting four meters. So whatever you have to do to set up your device, you say, okay, that we know that on the practice log, we're, we have maybe a sheet for four meters and we say, we need to set up the machine this way and we know what settings we have uh, to hit four meters. And then you repeat that for four and a half, for five, for five and a half, all the way to eight. That way, the day of the event, when I tell you what your distance is, they just have to look up for that particular distance, what settings they know will hit that distance. And that's the information they use. Okay, uh, so we should be creating these and designing these machines to shoot at these different levels. Correct. And you'll know that by practice. For example, if you're using a rubber band, you'll know that, okay, let's say we have a medium-sized rubber band and we pull it, that we stretch it so far on my device and let it go, it seems to hit four or four and a half or whatever consistently. So you record that data on there. Um, so the more they practice and the more more times they shoot, the more, the, the more they'll know um, what works and what anything that doesn't hit those distances you really don't care about you're only really interested in the data that that gets you to the target distances because those are the ones you're trying to hit uh, now i have seen some teams that they if they're not getting to those distances they simply pull their device back because they get frustrated uh, but if you have a if, if you've done your homework in 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 the beginning and, and you've practiced and you know that's you know if you set it up this way or that way, it gets to those distances. Those teams tend to be more successful because they already know what works. Okay. Uh, now, there is one little bit of information. If you're building a device that puts a ping pong ball into a tube, like a PVC tube or a metal tube of some sort, um, the, the standard ping pong ball is, I believe, allegedly 40 or 44 millimeters. Uh, interestingly enough, that apparently is an inside diameter of the ping pong ball, and the thickness of the ping pong ball can make a difference depending on who the manufacturer is for a standard ping pong ball. So when you, if you're going to create a device that is launched out of a tube, uh, take a piece of the tube with you when you buy the ping pong balls and make sure the ball actually fits down that tube and doesn't get stuck. We okay. found that out, uh, unfortunately, the first time uh, we had this event and a couple of people commented that they, they, they launched their first ping pong ball and it got stuck and they didn't know what to do. So it's important that the ping pong ball actually fits down the, uh, uh, down whatever pipe or, or tube that you're <coughs> using to create your device. And it'll obviously make a difference as to whether you're using PVC or metal of some sort or you know some other plastic, because they all have different uh, standards when they're manufactured, the, the balls themselves and, uh, and the, the tubes that you're using. Okay, okay. anybody Just, can help make this for us, like help us make this, right? Yeah, typically we okay. So we 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 prefer that the children are the ones making the device, but we also recognize that uh, some devices are a little bit more complicated or maybe require power tools, 
and some parents aren't comfortable with their kids and maybe the kids aren't comfortable using certain power tools. So helping them is okay. Uh, but as much as, as is practical, uh, it's, it's nicer to, it, we, we, we want, we want to encourage the kids to be, uh, the biggest participants in creating these devices. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Yep. Thank you. You're welcome. I, let, let's just put it this way. I've seen some highly polished looking machines that were obviously made in, in dad's shop, as it were, <laughs> uh, it, it's much it's much more fun I think when when it's the kids coming up with the ideas and you know a little help from dad uh, or mom is is okay <clears throat> if if that answers your question thank you um, you're welcome uh, are there any other questions? There's no such thing as a, as, a, as a silly question, by the way. It's the question that doesn't get asked that might, might, uh, that might help you. So it's important. Don't never be afraid to ask a question. Uh, we, have a question we, have from, uh, we have a question from Sherelle. Sherelle? Can the device be powered by batteries or electricity? Uh, it can be powered by batteries. Uh, electricity, you can't have an extension cord because it's very rare that we have the ability to uh, run a cord out to somebody's device. So everything has to be kind of self-contained, whether you use some sort of a compressed air cylinder, uh, normal, you know, like Duracell or EverReady batteries, that kind of thing. You can't use a car battery because it's lead acid um, uh, you, and you can't use an extension cord but batteries would be permissible. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Any, let's see. Uh, we have a question in the chat from Brian. What is the official deadline for impounding eight, eight to nine? Uh, um, eight, sorry, eight, eight, eight to nine, nine thirty. When can we bring the launcher? You can bring it in before then. Usually, I get in. Er we we get in early enough to set up the uh, for the event. So we'll have all of the the we'll have the target in place. We'll have the striping on the floor ready. You know the 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 eight positions for the teams already there. We have a table set up. Uh, when you get there, uh, the earlier you get there, the better because on the big day in May, there's typically seventy to eighty teams. So it takes us a while to have the teams come in, put their device on. We have to count the number of balls, make sure you don't have more balls than you're allowed. We make sure the device is safe, that you have all of the tools you need, the goggles, all of that. Once we know, and, and your data sheets, once we know that everything's there, you're officially uh, put into impound and you're all set for uh, when you come up to, to shoot, uh, whatever your time is that you, you know, with all your other events. Um, but then I, I believe in pound, usually it goes to nine or nine 30. I can't, I'd have to look at the schedule before that particular day. Uh, but as long as you're before that, you're okay. Uh, usually you'll know that you'll have that information, uh, before, before the day uh, in terms of uh, what the schedule is for impound. But I, we have uh, another question in the chat from Christine. Is there a suggested timeline to be able to develop and test? A uh, suggested, uh, uh, suggested timeline? I mean, you have from now till, say, districts to come up with a device. Um, and I, one would assume that before your district tournament, you have practiced and developed some uh, uh, some data for your data charts so you have a kind of an idea how uh, your device will will function your di your district tournament is probably the best time you have to really put it into practice kind of on a uh, so that you can see how it would perform under actual uh, uh, competition conditions because we'll you know while the districts tend to be smaller in terms of team numbers uh, we still try to, I like to try and shoot them. So you may only have four teams, for example. So we'll shoot all four teams at the same time so that they get a sense of what it's like 
on on the real uh, ext- uh, uh, day in May. Um, so the more data you have before then, and you'll also figure out, oh, wait, this isn't working. Um, one assumes that between now and your district tournament, you've already you know practiced at your house or uh, you know in your basement or something, and, and set up some way to, uh, to to have a target to do your practice and 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 develop your uh, to collect your data. Does that does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay, thank good good. <clears throat> And we have, Hi, this is, uh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, thanks. I have a couple of questions. So are, are they allowed to bring a measure date to measure the distance from the starting line to their launcher if they wanted to at the event? Yes. What you would do is you would, uh, that, that measuring device, you would include that as one of the tools you need to, to launch, uh, you know, for your launch. So you would impound that device and that would be considered part of your equipment. Okay. Do we have to have a, like a list of everything we're impounding or do we just bring it to the impound? You just bring it to the impound. Typically, it'll be the launcher itself, which will have your your team name and number on it. It will be a bag, hopefully clear, uh, with all 15 balls in it, properly marked, with just the team number uh, and the team name, if you like. Uh, your data sheet with your team name and number on it and any tools or, or you know, uh, whether it's a screwdriver, a wrench, a measuring tape, uh, whatever you need to to uh, adjust and or launch your device, any of it or all of that, basically all of that you include uh, at impound and uh, then you're usually set to go. Also your goggles. Now, there have been cases where teams have need goggles for other events. And as long as we know that, and they bring the goggles to the event. Uh, once they're done with their other event, uh, that's okay. We'll probably we won't let them shoot without them. But as long as you bring them from the say whatever other event they have to this event, you're, you're still good. Okay, gotcha. Okay, and then uh, do you do you happen to have the schedule at least for the March event that you could share with us? Uh, I do not yet. No. I, I will get that at some point, um, and I believe you you f- uh, folks should be party to that information as well, as I understand. Okay, I can I can check you know, on that. Okay, do you typically know like what what time frame is it? Usually like a half day that we're at the at the whole event, or is it just like a, a an hour or two, or what, do you, uh, well, can you give us at least? idea what to expect okay so for our event uh you'll come in everybody you know you you, we might have up to 20 teams depending on which district it is they all check in their devices set them in the gym usually we just have them line them up down one side of the gym uh we 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 check them we'll we'll tell you if your device for example is well maybe this is unsafe so you might want to adjust it say before the may event so it's our opportunity to tell you if you need to make any adjustments. It's your opportunity to shoot kind of in a real world practice kind of way. Uh, and we can offer up ideas without being specific uh, of ways you might want to change things if you're having trouble. Uh, we, uh, As an example, we had a young fellow who, who had shot a device that partway through fell apart and and the young man had a a bit of a meltdown um and we told him it's okay stuff like this happens you don't panic sometimes people's devices something falls off the kids don't know what to do improvise let them figure out you know if you need to hold the thing down with your hands because something is loose you do whatever you have to do try to get the shots off uh that's okay and it kind of shows uh uh, how shall I say, courage under fire. Um, but it also gives you an opportunity to figure out, oh, wait, this is not functioning. We can make it better, make it more solid so it doesn't fail during the big event. So that's another benefit of having the districts. It shows you where you, you need to uh, kind of do better. Yeah. 
Does that answer your question? Uh, yeah. So, so would we? I mean, I'm st I'm, st I'm basically trying to get an idea of: Am I going to be there from like nine to twelve? Am I going to be there oh, from nine to three? Uh, no. I mean, if for our event, if you're if you show up, uh, you know, if if you've founded and we say, okay, you got you four teams are here. Let's set up and let you shoot. Uh, from the time from the time you we tell you okay get behind this line once the, and, and then we tell you go um, yeah, especially in one of the districts where we're scoring you might be there for 20 minutes or so because okay. you know, because we'll try and run it uh, with the exception of Utica which tends to be more kind of very loose uh, we try to run it kind of like you know basically the same as we do on the main event. So you shouldn't be there more than about 20 minutes. Uh, we have allowed teams to, you know, they've asked, can we can we do another practice shoot? You know, and if there's not, you know, if there's enough space, then we say, yeah, go ahead, because this is a practice session. So we do allow gotcha. that. 